G'day everyone, my name's Ebony Bennett. I'm Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to our Economics of a Pandemic webinar series. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on, of the land on which I live and work, which is the Ngunnawal people. I acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present. I'd also like to welcome any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us on this webinar today. And during the pandemic, the Australia Institute is aiming to do these webinars at least weekly, but we had two this week, for example, at different times. So to check those dates and times, make sure that you're subscribed or check out our website at tai.org.au forward slash webinars so you don't miss out. To help this run smoothly today, although I'm sure most of you are old, old hands at this by now, if you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should be able to see a Q&A function where you can ask questions of our panelists and you should also be able to upvote questions from other people as well as make comments on their questions. Please keep things civil and on topic in the chat or we'll boot you out. <laughs> Some people do find the chat distracting and we've had a couple of emails about that. If you click on that chat box, it will come up as a separate window that you can minimize or push to the side of your screen. So hopefully that's less distracting, but we do enjoy the chat. So we're not gonna shut that down. And lastly, this discussion is being recorded today and will be posted on our website and emailed to all of you after this discussion. Uh, so keep an eye out for that if you have to leave uh, halfway through for any reason. So the ACCC, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, is Australia's competition regulator and national consumer law champion. And back in 2018, the federal government tasked the ACCC with undertaking a digital platforms inquiry with one of the widest remits in the world and with a special eye to measuring the impact of the major digital platforms Google and Facebook have had on Australian news media businesses. Quality journalism uh, benefits democracy by keeping citizens informed and engaged in public debate and at its best by scrutinising the powerful and exposing the corrupt. And Australia's media industry is one of the most highly concentrated in the world. And like news media across the globe, has been dealing with declining revenues from traditional sources, impacting on the media's ability to fund quality journalism. And the pandemic has sadly accelerated this trend. And since early 2019, uh, there's been reports of more than 150 newsrooms closing temporarily or for good, as well as many local and community newspapers in particular, ceasing to print or going digital only. The ACCC draft report was released at the end of 2018, and the final 600 page report was released in July 2019, and it made 23 recommendations to government, spending competition law, consumer protection, media regulation, as well as privacy issues. And the introduction of a media bargaining code for digital platforms was one of the key recommendations of the report. The final report aimed to find ways to balance the market power now held by two of the biggest media companies in the world, or biggest companies in the world, full stop, which became giants through the ubiquitous use of their services by people globally, and clever acquisitions of then smaller rivals like Android, YouTube, DoubleClick, WhatsApp, WhatsApp and Instagram that at the time uh, failed to attract the attention of regulators. Voluntary bargaining between Australian media businesses and Google and Facebook began at the beginning of this year. And in April, the treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, was a bit frustrated by the slow progress being made and by some of the differing views on the value of news content to the platforms and vice versa. And he then directed the ACCC to begin drafting a mandatory bargaining code. In July this year, the ACCC published its draft bargaining code for consultation. And in mid-August, Google began warning Australian consumers about the impact of the draft code via a yellow alert that I'm sure most of you have seen across all its services, including search, news and YouTube. And earlier this month, Facebook threatened to remove all news from its platform if the code went ahead in its current form. Rather neatly, I think, illustrating Google and Facebook's enormous market power and reach. The ACCC now has until the end of October to submit final draft legislation for the mandatory bargaining code to the government. And the government says that it remains committed to getting this legislation through the parliament this year. And there's not actually many weeks of parliament left. So to discuss all of this, we're delighted to be joined today by the chair of the ACCC, Rod Sims, who will be in conversation today with our chief economist, Richard Dennis. 
Rod Sims was appointed the chair of the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission in August of 2011 for an initial five year term, reappointed for a further three years in 2016, and then for a further three years until July 2022, making him the longest serving chair of the ACCC. Welcome Rod Sims and thanks for joining us today. Um, can I begin by asking you what problem is the ACCC trying to solve with this code for people who are perhaps unfamiliar? Thanks, Ebony, and good question. So what you find is that Google and Facebook need media for their platforms, but they don't need any particular media company, whereas all the individual media companies need to be on Google and Facebook. That creates an imbalance in bargaining power. That means it's impossible for the, and it's proved to be impossible for the media businesses to negotiate a fair payment for their content. And so the uh, code is trying to set up a framework so that they can negotiate fair payment for their content. And why that's, uh, that's so important, why this bargaining imbalance matters is as Ebony just said, this is about media news, journalism, it's absolutely fundamental to the proper working of our democracy. So we don't want uh, the tremendous market power that Google and Facebook have and how that plays out to damage journalism and media in Australia because democracy, all of us will be the loser. So Rod, you know, we're talking here under the code of Google and Facebook having to pay money to news companies in Australia. How will that work? How that works is it keys off the marketing imbalance, uh, Richard. So um, there's uh, the code requires bargaining, the code requires mediation, but the only way in economics that you ever really address a, a severe bargaining power imbalance is if you have a forcing device. And here the forcing device is arbitration. So the parties negotiate, you know, they've negotiated before, but they've got nowhere. So now they can negotiate, but the news media businesses know that if that doesn't work out, they can go to arbitration and the arbitrator can determine what's the appropriate payment. Uh, now we've said it, so, so we hope and actually expect that on many occasions, if not, well, hopefully all, but it probably won't work out that way, but most occasions that uh, they'll just bargain their way to a successful conclusion, but do so with the, bar with the media companies knowing they can revert to arbitration if they need to. Just knowing that, uh, having that ability increases their bargaining power. So, um, uh, but if it has to go to arbitration, then what we have in mind is a final offer arbitration. That's where each side, a platform, a media business puts in their best offer. And that best offer uh, is then an arbitrator decides which offer is the most appropriate given the criteria the arbitrators given. So this avoids ambit claims uh, and hopefully gets an efficient outcome. So who, who gets to decide who bargains? Who gets to decide what news is? That's determined by the ACMA, the Australian Communications and Media Authority. But on most occasions, it's going to be really straightforward, right? I mean, you know that the Melbourne Age... The Guardian, of course, they immediately walk through the door. So it, it's really a, a set of criteria uh, that are there to decide uh, borderline cases. And, and basically the criteria, I mean, there's a range of them, but in essence, it's all about what is core news? What is news that uh, where you're predominantly providing news that encourages public debate whether it's politics, whether it's a courtroom issue, whether it's an important community or local event. So that's the definition. ACMA will determine who's in, who's out. But as I say, 90% of the time, it'll be very straightforward. Um, Rod, I was going to ask, uh, we've heard a lot in the media about uh, this being kind of the first of its kind um, type of an, an arrangement. What have other countries tried to implement in the same area and, and what did you learn from um, overseas regulators trying to manage this market imbalance? Yeah, look, it's been an issue all around the world and still is. Uh, what's being tried in Europe, particularly Spain, 
France is uh, to build a regime around copyright where there's a view that that media content has certain copyright pro properties and that copyright needs to be rewarded by uh, the platforms. Uh, that uh, our, our approach is completely different. It is about addressing the marketing, bargaining power imbalance so that you get a proper commercial negotiation, one that comes with fair outcomes. We're really setting up a framework for negotiation, whereas they were trying to determine a copyright outcome. I guess the important thing we learned is that when you have a bargaining power imbalance, so, so what happened in France and, in, and Spain is in Spain, Google just said, all right, well, we won't show any more news on Google News. And in France, they said, okay, well, we'll pay, but the answer is zero. We're going to pay zero. And their regimes couldn't cope with that. Because we're dealing with a bargaining, a bargaining power imbalance, because the traditional way to deal with that that we deal with all the time at the ACCC is to have arbitration, then that's what we've learned. We've learned you need arbitration and you also need a provision so that platforms can't discriminate between businesses depending on what, how they're participating in the code. So the arbitration, the non-discrimination are really devices that make, that make this work and overcome why it's failed overseas. So I guess the other option is the, the idea of a, a digital tax that, you know, if, if, if the, these companies are making so much money, why not just tax them and spend the money however we want? Why, why go down this bargaining path? because we're addressing a bargaining power imbalance. We want proper commercial negotiation. That's the problem. That's the solution. A digital tax, really, Richard, is just a red herring. I mean, I don't know back, Richard, you can probably remember this as well. We used to have a debate about a gold tax in the 70s, I think. And that was because gold was exempt from tax and the government of the day wanted to tax gold, like every other industry, was taxed. And we were told, don't have a gold tax, when in fact it was just taxing gold companies like every other company. It's the same thing with digital platforms. The, the digital tax is all about, are they paying appropriate tax? Or are they avoiding their tax obligations? So fix that as its own issue. If they pay their appropriate amount of tax, it can go into consolidated revenue, build more schools, provide more uh, social security and all the other things government do. It's a completely different issue. Tax. And we were saying that the digital tax is all about fix that as its own by more uh, social security. You, you know, here we're trying to solve for bargaining power imbalance for the future of media in Germany. Digital tax is about revenue, completely different issue. Um, uh, so you said at the outset media is different. Obviously, we've got a bargaining code here that, you know, it's Quite a, quite a big stick. It's not the sort of thing that we use elsewhere. Is, is this because the media industry needs some sort of subsidy or is this because uh, they deserve compensation for the disruption? I mean, wh why is this different and, you know, where does this approach lead us? Yeah, look, two points if I could, Richard. It's a very good question. Uh, firstly, we're addressing here a market power imbalance this isn't a subsidy and I'll come back to that. With the market, balance, market power imbalance, of course, as you know, and as I know, there's market power imbalances everywhere throughout the economy. They're often called by economists market failures and they're everywhere. So why do we address this one? We address this one because it is damaging journalism, it is damaging news media, and that's so fundamental to democracy, the fourth estate, as it's called. I mean, I often get criticised by the media. I don't always like it, but I accept it's part of a functioning democracy and so we need it. So that's why this particular market failure is getting addressed in this comprehensive ways, whether other market failures might not. Going to the question of subsidy, this, in my view, has got nothing to do with the subsidy. This is about Let's, I mean, if you had a competitive market, you wouldn't need this. That is, the, the news media businesses would bargain with the whole range of companies providing search and news and social media, uh, and they'd get a fair outcome. Because you've got this massive bargaining power imbalance because Google dominates search, 
Facebook dominates social media. Uh, you can't have a proper negotiation. And so that's what we're trying to facilitate. It, it's not a subsidy. I mean, I've heard arguments by people saying, well, hang on, uh, hasn't uh, Google and Facebook simply outcompeted um, news media business? Are they just building a better mousetrap? The answer is no, 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 no. This is not, Richard, to use the term you and I are familiar with, uh, uh, you know, Schumpeter's creative destruction. This is not one business taking over for another. Google and Facebook don't produce news. News media businesses do. So there's no question of subsidy. This is just about addressing a market power imbalance and one that really matters to the future of our society. So you, you make it all about fairness and, you know, to be, to be clear, that's, that sounds like a good focus to me. You know, economics often assumes away bargaining power differences. Uh, when we talk about free markets, we typically assume that everyone in the market has some uh, enough degree of market power to stand up for themselves. So the whole design of this is about fixing a fundamental unfairness. But uh, of course, Google think that the code is fundamentally unfair. What, what do you say to their concerns about, uh, for example, the, the obligation to talk to people about their, their algorithm or uh, the, the other disruptions to them? Like, if it's all just about fairness, why, why are they focusing on, on the unfairness of sharing that information? Look, two points, uh, Richard, again, if I could. Uh, this code is a mandatory one. It's getting Google and Facebook to do what they don't want to do. Um, they'd rather bargain from the position of strength without having the arbitration there so they can dictate the terms. Um, that's understandable. Everybody would do the same if they had that level of bargaining power. So the code is about trying to uh, address that. And yes, Google have got concerns about it. Some of it is that they just don't like it. Uh, others are things that we're happily going to engage with them on. I mean, we're engaging with them on all their issues and uh, we'll make changes to address some of those issues, not all, but some. Uh, I mean, they've raised issues about uh, the fact that they, that they see that news media business will be able to somehow control their algorithms. Well, that's not what we think the code says. That's not what we meant. So we'll engage with them and clarify that so that there's no way that the news media businesses can interfere with the algorithms of Google or, or Facebook. They've also said the code requires them to provide their data to news media businesses. That's not the case. The code is quite clear that Google and Facebook only provide the data they want to provide. They already do provide some, and we're just trying to clarify what that is and make sure people understand how best to use it, which the smaller businesses often struggle with. So we're requiring them to help uh, companies explain what Facebook and Google are already providing. There's nothing in the code that forces Google or Facebook to share the data from individuals that they collect, Google and Facebook collect, with the news media businesses. So look, we'll, we'll clarify things where we need to and where we're, we're engaging strongly with Google and Facebook, but we understand uh, they'd rather not. They'd rather the code not be here. Um, I had a kind of a follow up question to that. I guess uh, I did allude to the fact that Facebook has threatened to withdraw news from its platform uh, in Australia, and I've got a question here from Lisa Vincenton that kind of um, picks up on that theme. Do you think that Facebook will follow through on its threat to block Australia from sharing news on its platforms if the legislation proceeds? Oh look, I I honestly don't know. That's, that's my best answer I can give. Uh, we'll engage with Facebook, just like I mentioned, we'll engage with Google. We'll try and address issues where we can. Uh, at the end of the day, the government's going to have to make a decision about what it wants in this code. Uh, and then it's, of course, up to Google and Facebook as to how they react. But, you know, there's, there's no doubt that they would rather this code not occur. Uh, therefore, they'll argue strongly against it. Uh, I guess we'll only know what they're going to do in response to the code uh, when the code's there and they're confronted with the final form of the code. But I just emphasize again, what we put out is a draft code. 
right? It was only, a, it, it's a draft. So uh, we'd look a bit silly if we didn't make any changes to a draft. We'd look a bit um, uh, pig-headed. So no, there will be changes and they'll, they'll come from the uh, discussion with Facebook and Google and they'll come from changes with news media businesses. And let me tell you, we've got a lot of input which we're sifting through. But at the end of the day, what they do is their call and, and I can't, uh, I don't know what they're going to do. I think it'd be a shame for uh, Australian democracy, it would be a shame for Facebook users if they chose that course of action. I guess the only thing I would say is if it becomes known that you can never get news media on Facebook, what does that do to Facebook's uh, standing? Uh, will people go elsewhere? There's been some surveys that suggest that were done by The Guardian that suggest they will. Uh, I don't know whether they're done by The Guardian or published by The Guardian, but uh, I, I read them in The Guardian. Um, so I, I, it's up to Facebook to make the call. But I think it will, it will also weaken Facebook. So it, it's their call. As Ebony said, everyone has probably seen the, the, the Google announcements and Facebook's threat to leave Australian news behind is not going to notice. What, what are the other news players saying about the draft code? A whole range of things, Richard. I think it's fair to say no one is completely happy, uh, which is what you expect in a uh, thing like this. Uh, they, they have a range of views on, you know, particularly what is the definition of core news that allows them to participate. Um, views on uh, uh, guidelines that guides the arbitrator, views on a range of non-monetary matters. So uh, great spectrum of views. Some, some, some of them care about certain things, that others don't and vice versa. So we're in this kind of fight between Google and Facebook on the one side and the Australian media on the other. But of course, the Australian media is hardly a level playing field either. We've got you know, News Corp and Nine is a duopolist and a hell of a lot of smaller independent news outlets. Uh, what do you say to those who say, well, in fighting Australian news versus Google and Facebook, you're actually just entrenching the power of, of Nine and News to the detriment of media diversity? Yeah, look, I, I understand that, Richard. I've, I've heard that. I, I guess I just observe firstly, of course, yes, we've got News Limited, we've got uh, uh, Nine, which owns Channel Nine, as everyone knows, as well as the Fairfax Media and the Macquarie Radio Network. Um, but of course, you've also got Channel 10, Channel 7, you've got the ABC, which is now uh, uh, radio, TV and online. So there's a new dimension to the ABC. Uh, now you've got then new players, which the internet's facilitated, which is terrific. The Guardian, Daily Mail, um, but a whole lot of other players, uh, BuzzFeed until recently when they, they actually left. Um, so uh, conversation, just a whole range of others that everyone knows I'd be here all day if I ran through the name. So, so I guess the, the problem we're facing is if we don't bring in something like the code, it'll be only the big players that'll survive. I mean, we have all seen BuzzFeed, uh, I think effectively close down their media uh, reporting in Australia um, and others are feeling the pressure. But when the pressure's on, the bigs that can survive, I, I suspect News Corp and Nine will always be here, but you don't know how many of the others will be here. So the code is about uh, giving everybody a chance to participate, everybody a chance to survive in this very difficult environment. If it's just survival of the fittest, if we don't have the code, I think you'll have a lot less diversity because a lot of players will fall away. Also under the code, we have allowed collective bargaining. Uh, that means the small players can get together and bargain collectively and pool their resources. And we're thinking about how we help the smaller players a lot more. So uh, I think the answer, Richard, to me is uh, if we don't do something, we'll have a much narrowed uh, media landscape that will see more concentration, not less. The code is about enhancing media diversity, in my view. I see the dilemma, but I, I guess Facebook threatening to leave altogether has got some small media proprietors saying that we get a lot of traffic from Facebook. So if, if, if the cost of the code is Facebook leaving and Facebook leaves, that's bad for some small players. Again, I see the dilemma, but there's, that's, that's surely a risk. 
Oh, look, it potentially is, Richard. I guess it's, uh, you know, there's a range of media players. Obviously, you've got players like The Guardian, Australian Community Media, a whole range of players who aren't saying what you've just said. Uh, there's some very small players who uh, are concerned about uh, that. And, of course, nobody wants Facebook to leave. Don't get me wrong. I mean, nobody wants Facebook to leave. Uh, of course, Facebook... Um, don't want the code. But as I said earlier, I hope they stay. It'll be up to them whether or not they do. But I think as that Guardian survey I mentioned in The Guardian showed, if people can't get uh, their news through Facebook, then they'll go elsewhere to get their news. And either they'll go directly to websites because they're aware of The Guardian or Australian Community Media or Fairfax or whatever else, or new sites will spring up that will be a source of news for people to go to. So, look, I understand the concern. Uh, I hope Facebook doesn't uh, uh, stop showing news. Ultimately, it's their call. Uh, but I think, you know, I've sat, Richard, with um, on, on many occasions, well north of 10 meetings with all news media businesses, and I've heard universal support for the code and what the code's trying to achieve. So there's a lot of small players really barracking hard for this code to come into existence. Um, we'll go very shortly to questions from uh, the audience. I can see we've got uh, about 650 people uh, on the webinar with us today. Thank you all for joining us. Um, but just before we go there, I think what you're just talking about with Facebook, uh, you know, threatening to leave and Google putting out this uh, mass open letter that's on every bloody platform. Um, this really is a, a kind of a, a global fight. Uh, it must be being watched by other competition regulators and antitrust regulators across the world. Um, are you talking to any of your counterparts overseas about this? And how does it compare to other big antitrust battles that we've seen in the past? Uh, we are very much talking to our counterparts overseas. Uh, I've appeared, uh, provided testimony to uh, US Congress committees. Uh, I've been in close touch with people in the US, uh, but also in Europe and the UK. So they're, they're all wrestling with the same problem. Uh, there's been a big debate in the US about this for a number of years and in Europe for a number of years. Uh, there's been a report written on exactly this issue in the UK, so we're in touch with, with everybody. Um, I think the, you know, you talk about past battles, you know, we've had big issues with monopolies in railway, railways and telecommunications uh, uh, early last century or, yeah, pretty early last century, and antitrust dealt with those by splitting them up. Of course, the rail, railroads and telecoms hated that. Uh, and fought it bitterly. Uh, we're not suggesting anything as drastic as that. Uh, we don't think that's the way to go. We just want to set up a, a framework for commercial negotiation so that news media businesses can get a fair return. Uh, so, but look, this, this idea of confronting monopolies or those with significant market power, it, it happens quite a lot. It happens quite a lot in Australia uh, when we used to regulate Telstra, uh, railways, ports. So it's not an uncommon problem. And the solution that we've got in this code is, in Australian terms, pretty much in the groove of how we'd normally deal with that market power imbalance. Now, other countries do things differently. Uh, they've tried different things. They haven't worked. Uh, I imagine they are looking at what we're doing. But of course, they've got their own legal regime. So Yes, confronting monopolies is a, is a long-standing problem and uh, one we're dealing with here again. Um, I'm just going to go, we've actually got Senator Sarah Hanson-Young on the line, uh, the Green Senator from South Australia. Um, Sarah, do you have, uh, are you there? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you do hear you, me, Ebony? We can. Uh, what's your right. question for Mr Sims? Look, um, Obviously, a lot of work has been put into this. And, um, of course, the big tech companies are, um, as you point out, not happy about it. Um, I know as a politician that they're knocking on our doors and, and, uh, and, and wanting to tell us all about how bad this will be for their business model. Um, firstly, I just wanted to know, uh, Rod, um, 
are you um, uh, supportive of the idea of having the public broadcasters included in this code? I know they're not in the draft, but I feel very strongly that if uh, you know Murdoch and Nine are going to get a payment from these big companies, then so should, too should uh, the ABC and SBS. Um, and secondly, um, I just want to pick up on one of the things that you mentioned, and that was the type of that Google and Facebook are not in and of themselves news agencies. Um, they, and I would argue that they are indeed the world's biggest advertisers. And that's what we're dealing with here. Um, is that a fair uh, articulation of, of kind of their business model? Um, and of course, would you like to see the public broadcasters included? Thanks, Senator. Thanks, Sarah. And uh, I should have said to Ebony a long time ago, please call me Rod. So thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Sorry, Rod. <laughs> exactly what I want. Uh, I really actually don't like being, I mean, I much prefer to be called Rod. So thank you, Sarah. Um, I'll just go back in reverse order. So uh, I agree with you. Google and Facebook have got just stunningly clever business models, you know, where they'll provide you so-called free services. Uh, but the, the price is actually your data. So they give you free services, you take advantage of them, they get all your data, and then they can advertise to you. So they are massive uh, advertisers uh, make essentially all their money from advertising. So uh, you're, you're quite right in how you characterise them. And that's the point I made earlier. They're not publishers. I mean, the, the, con the, the news media content is made by news media companies. If they disappear, we lose something that Google and Facebook are not intending and not in the business to replace. So very different businesses having this incidental effect on news media businesses, which is quite, has quite drastic consequences. Look, with the ABC, SBS, um, we did not provide advice on that issue. We took the view that that's one for government and uh, given what you've just said, one for parliament to resolve and I'll look forward to see how you do that. Uh, our view was that since government funds uh, the uh, ABC and SBS, uh, ABC pretty well largely, SBS mainly, that um, it's really an issue for the government to decide. Uh, and I guess the other factor that was in our mind was that the, the question of whether the ABC gets involved in what is really a commercial negotiation, uh, which of course they don't do now because they're publicly funded, is really an issue for government. So look, uh, I'm going to hand all this one back to the government and, of course, back to the parliament. So we didn't provide advice on it. Uh, uh, we, we'll leave that to government and the parliament. Uh, you know, democracy, you, I'm sure you'll sort it out. I love it when people have faith in democracy. Um, but speaking of sort of uh, your opinion on things, Rod, last week you made it quite clear that uh, you thought there was a strong public policy case for the government to support the AAP Newswire service. And indeed, earlier in the year when News and Nine uh, said they were going to shut AAP down, you made clear at the time you thought that AAP should continue. Um, given your, you know, given your support for the role of AAP in providing wholesale news to hundreds of small outlets, why, why have they been left out of the code? Thanks, Richard. Good question. So one of the other recommendations we made one of the 23 recommendations was about a news media bargaining code. Another one was that there should be public funding for particularly rural and regional media, which we saw uh, under threat, even with the code going ahead. Um, and so within that context, uh, I think funding for AAP would be a great idea. AAP are the, uh, you know, they are, they independently provide a newswire services that, that just about all papers pick up. Uh, certainly some have told me that if it wasn't for the AAP, uh, they, couldn't have been, they couldn't have come into existence. Uh, some of the bigger ones don't need them as much, but, but the smaller ones still do, certainly rural and regional do. So having the AA, AAP is absolutely fundamental. Uh, and uh, if there's a role for government funding, we would fully support that. The reason they're not in the code is because they're selling their content to news media businesses. So if The Guardian, say, does a deal with um, uh, Google for payment for Guardian content, some of that Guardian content is going to come from AAP. So The Guardian will get paid for that. 
if AAP get paid for it as well from Google, Google's paying twice. So I think the benefit for, from the code for AAP is that the people, their customers who buy their product will be better remunerated for the product and I'm hoping that feeds through to higher prices, better prices for AAP. But in a sense, but, but as I say, I think there's also a good case for public funding of the AAP. But I think they'll benefit indirectly from the code, Richard. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to exercise my prerogative of host one last time and take a question from uh, Peter Lewis. He's the director of the Australia Institute Centre for Responsible Technology. Um, Pete, are you there? Yeah, hi everyone and um, thanks for your work, Rod. Um, as you would be aware, I hope, um, the Centre's been leaning in behind the proposition that this code will make our public square stronger. Um, it's been interesting to see the feedback, particularly from many of our colleagues on the progressive side of politics, and some of it's in the chat today. And I, I don't want to misrepresent their views, but I would like to get your, your, your response. I think the two lines of criticism of the code, the sort of big one is, this is the news limited code, and it's been established to prop up the interests of an organisation which doesn't operate in the interest of democracy. And I guess, the broader thing that you pick up from guys like Mike Cannon Brooks and a lot of the tech community is that this is an attempt for an old industry to hold back the change of a new industry. So I'm just, and I, I personally don't subscribe to those lines, but I think they're valid things to confront. And I'm really interested in your reflections on those two lines of criticism. Yes, thank you, Peter, and I have absolutely observed your support. So thank you for that, and and for your perspective on uh, on on what the code's about. That's been uh, I've learnt from it, and I hope others uh, have. Look, you've raised two points, and I'll deal with them in the order you raise them. As I said earlier, to it was either a question from Richard or Ebony, but uh, this isn't about News Limited. Uh, I accept they're a big player, but uh, you know, Nine's a big player. Uh, Channel 7's a big player, Channel 10's a big player, um, Guardian is getting bigger in terms of clicks, as is the Daily Mail, ACM does pretty well. There's a whole range of players out there. This is about helping news media businesses uh, survive and prosper. Certainly, you know, I, I, my view would be that if this code was in place BuzzFeed would still have journalists in Australia. That, that's my view and it's informed by a few discussions I've had. So I think this does help the smaller players, the less strong players survive. It's therefore about media diversity. News Limited, of course, have been very vocal in support. Uh, I think it's probably fair to say the most vocal, but they're only a little bit ahead of The Guardian. I, I would in fact, I'd say that's a bit, bit line ball. I mean, I've seen very strong support from The Guardian, of course, support from Nine as well, but The Guardian's been, been very strong, as has ACM. But in terms of vocally out there in the community, The Guardian's been almost as strong as, as News Corp. I mean, you see News Corp because they've got newspapers in every city. So I guess I just, I, I you know, I don't, I, I mean, this point about News Corp being anti-democracy, which I think you mentioned, I guess, look, what we need in Australia, as in every country, is a diverse range of views. So, you know, we've got players on all parts of the spectrum. Well, may they all thrive because we want diverse views to get better decisions from our parliament, from our democracy. So, yes, there's people who don't like News Limited views. There's people who don't like the ABC views, people who don't like the Guardian views. But for me, let's have them all there. Your point about... Uh, old industry um, uh, holding back change, well, it may be an old industry, but as I said earlier, Google and Facebook are not replacing it. That's the misunderstanding I think that people like Mike Cannon Book say. Where's the journalism going to come from? Where's the media going to come from? Uh, that's what we're trying to help here. So, yes, Google and Facebook have come up with a fantastic really clever business model. Get free services, get your data, uh, advertise to you and away you go. But they're not providing media. They're not providing news. Uh, they're not, they, don't, they don't employ journalists. I mean, they're not replacing the news media businesses. We've just got to make sure that in this new world, we don't lose something that's really important to us 
and that is critical media coverage that helps our democracy function. And I am the first to accept that you need a whole range of media out there to make that happen. I, for one, in my job, it's my job to read a whole range of media. So, yes, I do read The Australian each day. I read The Melbourne Age, I read The Financial Review, and I read The Guardian. Now, there you've got all my... That, that covers a nice range. And most of the radio and TV I listen to is the ABC, so my secrets are out. Um, uh, but, but I'm getting a diverse range of views. And, yes, it's fascinating how I can read the same story in The Age and The Australian, and they've got a completely different perspective on them. But to me, that's healthy. Um, the next question is from Max Mason, who asks, uh, there doesn't seem to be an appeal mechanism within the draft code. Is there any concern that the current model might be challenged as non-constitutional? Uh, unconstitutional. Uh, yeah, understand that. Thanks, Max. Uh, the, uh, there's no challenge because this is like, this is a commercial arrangement, right? The ACCC is not the arbitrator. So this is just a commercial arbitration and often under commercial arbitration, uh, there are no appeals. Uh, this is about exchange for value. So I, I don't see the issue with any constitutional challenge. Uh, the best legal advice I've got is that, uh, that there's no issues on that front. So this is just like, I mean, think of this as a, we're setting up a framework for commercial negotiation and you've got arbitration and as with, you know, my experience as with all, arbitrations of commercial disputes, there is no appeal. The arbitration is the final uh, decision. And that's why you hope that actually that threat of the arbitration, when no one knows what the outcome is going to be, that hopefully will get people to make a deal before they get anywhere near arbitration. That's what we're hoping. Um, I think we have already touched on this, so perhaps you can answer this briefly, but uh, it's got a lot of upvotes here. The next question is from Neil Barker who asks, is there a danger that legislation will further entrench media concentration and the dominance um, in Australia through the provision of access to the back-end algorithms of the big social media companies? Well, thank you for that question. There is no access to the back-end algorithms. That's one of the um, uh, views that's occurred, but there's nothing in the code that gives access to the algorithms. Uh, there is a notice provision, give 28 days notice of something that's going to have a significant effect, but Google and Facebook could do that for all their users. In fact, that would probably be a good idea. Uh, but it's only when Google and Facebook judge that what they, do, what they are doing has a significant effect on uh, news media. There's no interference by news media in the front end, back end, any aspect of the algorithm. So... That's, I mean, I did use the term misinformation when some of this stuff came around and, uh, you know, that, that concern is just not true. If it were true, I'd be very concerned, but, but it's not. Look, in terms of diversity, as I say, I think, you know, people often think that our media is news and nine. Uh, in fact, most people get their media off TV and we've got five television stations. Uh, news isn't one of them. Um, uh, but nine is. Uh, a lot of people get their, their information off radio. Well, that's, you know, essentially Macquarie Network and the ABC. We, of course, got the ABC, which I'm and the ACCC is a strong supporter of. They're a crucial element of diversity. The good news is the internet has allowed us a whole lot more journalism. I mean, it is, it is great. We can get The Guardian. We can get The New York Times. Uh, we can get The Daily Mail. Those are quite different media businesses, uh, and we couldn't do that before. So I think the internet's helped diversity. What we want to do is make sure that media businesses can monetize. I mean, it takes a lot of money to have quality journalism providing news to Australians. We want to make sure people are properly rewarded for the work they put into that quality journalism, and that's going to help a wider range of players. Oh, it doesn't happen, I'm afraid you'll probably only have a couple of players standing. Mm. Um, the next question is from David Swan. He asks, uh, how confident are you that the code will be implemented as you've described it? And what's the danger of it being watered down or compromised? And if that happens, um, what potentially could be lost? 
oh, look, the code will change, uh, right? I mean, it's a draft. And draft is meant to elicit comment, and we've got a lot of comment. And so we're sifting our way through that, and there will be changes. But the, the, the core of the code can't change. That is, you, you need an arbitration mechanism. You need a non-discrimination clause. They're the, the bits of glue that hold the code together that make it workable. So I think I can just say to David that, that the, the core elements of arbitration and non-discrimination won't change. The way a range of things are described will. Whether that's a watering down will depend on your perspective. Uh, there'll be changes that some like and some don't. Uh, but that core element that addresses the marketing market balance won't change. That's what we put to government, let me hasten to say. What the government then does, what the parliament then does, uh, is up to uh, the government and the parliament. We'll do our best to get something we think is sensible to them in early October, and uh, then we'll see where it goes. Uh, the next question is from uh, Laurel Henning, who says that Google has suggested three tweaks to the code involving the reduction of the 28 days notice of algorithm changes to reasonable notice, uh, data sharing to not be above or beyond current information available to news publishers, and for the inclusion in the code of the value created for news publishers by the platforms. Um, when you talk about the code will change, um, uh, are those the kinds of suggestions that would be acceptable? And also, what was the platform's value to publishers left? Why was the, oh, now that's gone. Why was the Why, platform's value yeah. left out of the code? Yeah, yeah no, good, good question. So look, I'll try and be brief because I'm conscious you've got quite a I'll range of questions. <laughs> so look, the, I think Google's reaction to the algorithm notice change and the data issues were ones we didn't intend. They've read things in there that we didn't think were there. They may be right, they may be not, but we don't think they're there. But So we'll, we'll certainly clarify those. So I'm hopeful those will no longer be issues. Look, the value exchange is something we're thinking through. Uh, what we were trying to do is simplify uh, what the arbitrator's got to deal with. The, the, the trouble with value is it's hard to calculate. It's hard to get your hands around. Um, uh, where, because it's mainly indirect. I mean, as, as Google and Facebook have said many times, they don't do a lot of advertising against news media. But news media gets people onto the platform, uh, gives people a whole platform experience, allows them to do what they want to do in the platform. So it's a tremendous indirect value. Um, the issue with the clicks that Google and Facebook send to news media businesses' websites, what you don't know, what in a sense you can't know, is how many of those clicks would go through the website of the news media business, say the ages website, smh.com.au, whatever, if there wasn't that intermediary in Google and Facebook. Now, that Guardian survey I referred to, I don't want to make too much of it, uh, uh, just something I read that stuck in my mind, is that a lot of people, if they couldn't get their news out of Google and Facebook, would go straight to uh, the website of the media business. So, yeah, look, we're, we're going to give that a lot of thought. We'll be talking to Google and Facebook about that. Uh, it's a complex issue but you don't know what would happen if Google and Facebook were, if they, you know, Facebook does not show news on its platform, how many Facebook users will go straight to the news media business? So look, but look, we are giving thought to that issue. Um, the next question that I've got here is, uh, do you feel that Google and Facebook are fighting so hard against this code because they think it will then be a model for other countries to, uh, do the same thing? Uh, look, I think there is an element of that. Uh, hard to know, of course, uh, but I think there is an element of that. And, and the reason that, that applies is, of course, because Spain has tried to do exactly what we're doing and it didn't work. France has tried to do it and it hasn't worked. It's been under discussion in the US. So I guess the key point I'd make is in Australia, the we haven't 
invented it. We haven't you know, invented a problem that didn't exist before. It's, it's, it's an issue all around the world. Um, we've learnt from what other countries have done. So hopefully we've come up with a model that works. And if it does, hopefully other countries will adopt it. Uh, I think from Google and Facebook's point of view, um, I, I don't, I mean, I think the tide is turning and, and heading in this direction. So I'm rather hoping that we can sort through a deal that then they will be happy to replicate, knowing that I guess if for some reason they manage to walk away from whatever's done in Australia, they may find they get something even worse from other countries. So look, it is it is a world issue. We didn't invent the issue. Hopefully we're contributing to solving it. Uh, I accept that's in Google and Facebook's mind, um, but that's inevitable because it's a, this is a world problem, not, not just an Australian problem. Hopefully we're gonna to contribute to solving it. Uh, we've nearly run out of time. We've probably only got time for one or two more questions and I can see we've still got more than 600 people on the line here. So thank you very much everyone uh, for your questions. I'm sorry we won't be able to get to all of them, but we've uh, done our best to pick kind of a, a variety of, of questions here. Um, Richard, did you have any other questions? Uh, and we'll take one last uh, question from the audience. Uh, look, I, I guess a, a comment and a, and a, and a question. The, Rod, I mean, so much has changed in the media landscape in the last 20 years. I mean, when I was a kid, uh, people bought a newspaper and what they were buying was a newspaper full of classified ads. And on the ads, on the pages that didn't have classified ads, there were, there were all these display ads. So there's always been something pretty weird about the media. We, we think we're paying for the newspaper when we, you know, spend our dollar on it. Uh, but in reality, advertising has always paid for that. Now, Google and Facebook have invented the world's most customizable billboards that are now competing with that old fashioned idea of a newspaper. So uh, while supporting the idea of a code and supporting the idea of uh, anything that sort of equivalizes bargaining power, uh, is the role of government perhaps even bigger uh, in, in the modern media age than it's ever been, whether it's through public funding for AAP or public funding for the ABC or just regulation because a hundred years ago it was advertising in newspapers that paid for journalists. If the advertising goes somewhere else, it's the community service that we need journalism, but it's not obvious that advertising is the best way to pay for journalism. No, look, that's right. Things are evolving. I mean, one of the, I mean journalism is a public good uh, that's why we're strongly of the view that, of course, you need publicly funded ABC. That's, that's a, a key ingredient of this equation. And let, yes, they used to be funded by ads, uh, so it was always a funny model. And now we're in a new world. So in a new world, we require new solutions. And I think newspapers are trying to fund themselves more from subscriptions. But I think, Richard, we don't just want newspapers funded by subscriptions because, what, 5% of people are going to pay? Do we want just 5% of people getting news media? I don't think so. So Google and Facebook certainly benefit from having this news media on their platform. That gets more people to their platform. That allows them to get more data from those people and sell more ads. So... One way we can deal with the issue you've raised is to make sure that there's a proper bargain here to get paid. So just as the old model of advertising has changed, we're in a new world. This new world requires that this bargaining balance gets addressed and we have fairness in the relationship. And that's a key ingredient to keeping journalism going. Maybe it's not the only solution, Richard, but, but my own view is that if we get the code up, that will that, that will mean we can get continuing fair payment for a lot of journalism that'll support a lot of journalism whether we need more public funding for things like AAP for rural and regional papers my sense is we do but, but I think you put all that together then you can have a vibrant business uh, uh, news media business uh, uh, environment with plenty of diversity Sorry, and just very quickly, Rod, um, when, when will we see all the submissions you've received and, and when will we see a final edge or final proposed legislation from the ACCC? Yeah, because this is a policy process, not an ACCC process, even though we're the ones charged with doing the work, we've followed the Treasury experience uh, and advice on this, 
and what they do and what therefore we're going to do is publish the submissions once the legislation is introduced into the House. Uh, we'll have our advice to government, I hope, in early October. Will, of course, they then need to look at it and reflect on it and see what they think of it. Well, it might get introduced into the House um, in uh, late October, may get passed this year. I don't know. That's really in the hands of uh, Sarah Hanson Young and others who are in Parliament. So, but the submissions will get released when the legislation is introduced, Richard. Um, I have one last question, and I think this might be the last one from Andrew Wilkins. And you have slightly touched on this, but it is a quite a specific one, so I thought it was a good one to get in at the end here. Andrew has a small media business based in Australia, which has mostly international audience of around 270,000 readers. He asks, is this code for the big media companies only? And how would a company of his size even get Google or Facebook to respond to an email, let alone negotiate an agreement? If it applies to small to medium enterprises, how do you go about getting such an agreement? Good question. That's why we've allowed for collective bargaining. Uh, and we're hoping that smaller players can form bargaining groups. Uh, we're also, though, thinking through whether there's other ways that we can deal with small small media businesses. We're conscious that there's a lot of cost involved in bargaining, both for the small businesses themselves, and they don't have the resources, obviously, and for Google and, Plat and Facebook. They don't want to be confronted with 150,000 players. So we're trying to think how we do that, but this has been very carefully designed to help small media players Collective bargaining is a key part of that, but we're trying to think further how we can just make it easier uh, for those players. And I think Google and Facebook, uh, you know, it's not, it doesn't really matter to them as much paying a bit of money for the smaller players. So I'm, I'm confident this will work out well for the smaller players. Uh, well, we might wrap it up there. Thank you so much for your time today, Richard Dennis, and particularly to you, Rod Sims. We really appreciate you answering so many questions today. Sorry, the answers were a bit long. We would have got more in, my apologies. <laughs> no, it's been really great. And apologies, uh, everyone. We've had a, a great number of questions and we really do thank you for your input today. And hopefully we got to as many as we could and, and uh, covered a wide range of topics. Um, you can join us over the next couple of weeks for some more exciting webinars, beginning tomorrow with uh, Australia at Home's fortnightly tech talk. Uh, that'll be tomorrow from 1 to 2 p.m. That's on Surveillance Capitalism for Dun Dummies, featuring uh, Pete Lewis from the Australia Institute Centre for Responsible Tech. Next week uh, in this pandemic series, we'll be talking to Catherine Murphy from The Guardian. That's next Wednesday, the 23rd of September, um, on the end of certainty. Scott Morrison and Pandemic Politics, that's her quarterly essay uh, coming out. And on Wednesday, the 30th of September, again, we'll be talking to Pete Lewis from our Sense of Centre for Responsible Technology, along with Claire O'Neill and Robert Elliott Smith um, about uh, some fascinating uh, developments in the world of tech, uh, big tech companies and the internet. Make sure that you're along for that one. Details are available for that on our website at tai.org.au forward slash webinars. And make sure that you're subscribed to our podcast, Follow the Money. You can find that on iTunes or wherever you normally listen to podcasts. In this week's episode, we talk about uh, the uh, government's proposal to bring forward income tax cuts and why that's a pretty, well, poor idea to say the least in terms of economic stimulus and fiscal stimulus. And please remember to stay one and a half metres away, keep washing your hands and stay safe out there, everyone. Thanks very much. And we hope to see you next week. Thanks, Em. Thanks, Rod. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.